So, let's get to the Word. If you have your Bibles, open up to Romans chapter 11. Put your finger there, put a piece of paper there. We're going to come to that here in a minute. But there's something that I was, I was very convicted of last week um, in my message that I, I didn't get an opportunity to discuss. And, and I really, as I was going through this week, um, I really felt like we needed to back up and discuss this. Okay, So we've wrapped up our series on our identity in Christ. Well, we've wrapped up my discussing that for now. Uh, that, that series is ongoing because we're constantly learning new things about our identity in Christ. But um, the one thing that we talked about last week, uh, we, we were in uh, Peter, and it talked about us being a, a royal priesthood, a, a chosen generation, a chosen people. And one of the things that I feel like I need to address is the Israel issue. Okay? Um, <clears throat> starting about 300 A.D., um, the church made a decision to distance themselves from the unique Jewish roots of our faith. Okay? And there became a division that, that for whatever reason, some of the reasons were noble, some were ignoble, um, there became a split. And over the course of time, we have seen the church not just <clears throat> distance itself, excuse me, <clears throat> from Israel, but actually turn hostile to Israel. Um, I grew up in a church, I actually went to a Bible college that um, had a very strong foundation in replacement theology. Okay? And, and replacement theology is this. It's when you receive the teaching that Christianity, the Christian church, has supplanted Israel, and they are the new spiritual Israel, God's chosen. Okay? And I want to tell you right here, that's wrong. It's a lie. You cannot read Scripture, Old and New Testament, you cannot read them and come to that conclusion without dismissing large portions of Scripture. You can't come to that conclusion and still have security in your relationship with God because He says that He is faithful even when we are faithless. And if God has forsaken Israel because of their sin, what makes you think He will accept you despite yours? Okay? So let's back up. We're going to kind of go way back and then we're going to work our way up to Romans 11. Okay? So... Uh, you don't have to turn with me here, uh, but there are a couple passages I'm going to have you turn to. So Genesis, uh, chapter 32. Jacob is given the name Israel. Okay? Does anybody know what Israel means? God best lick. What's that? God best lick. Yeah, it means God contends. And he was given this name after having wrestled with God. Okay? And he said, you will no longer be called Jacob, you will be called Yisrael, contender of God, contends with God. Okay? Now, all of his children became known collectively as, as Israel. Alright? But we're going to back up even further. I wanted to address what does Israel even mean? It means contends with God. Okay? Now, Jacob received this as a blessing, but I think it was prophetic. Because the nation of Israel has, ever since its inception, contended with God. He calls them a stiff-necked people, a hard-headed people. Okay? Just like us. Alright? So let's back up a little bit more. Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> if you would turn there, we're just going to read the first few verses out of Genesis chapter 12. Keep your finger in Romans 11 because we're going to get there. <clears throat> Genesis 12, verse 1. 
<coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> so, Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1, says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Okay? And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And you and all the families of the earth, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now there's a couple things that I want to point out here. <clears throat> first, what does God tell Abram? It's the first thing he says. Go! Go! Keep that in mind, because we're going to come back and touch on that. But I want to establish a point that God so often requires of us. In faith, God often asks, asks us to action before the results. Okay? He tells Abram, go and I will. He doesn't say, I will and then you go. Okay? Go first and then I will. I will what? I will make of you a great nation. Now, God has his hand on the people of Israel. And we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit later. But if you ever look at the number of Nobel Prizes that Israel has, the, the, the citizens, the people of Israel blood, you will see that they are a unique people. Even now, having separated themselves from God, they are a unique people. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. We're going to address that a little bit further down here. But God says, go, and I will make of you a great nation. Now, that can be taken in a number of ways. One, <clears throat> he can make of them a great nation in the way that we think of a great nation. Lots of money, lots of power, lots of prestige, lots of people. Or, we can look at it in, in the way that I think God originally intended this. See, all of those things are simply symptoms, exactly, byproducts, perfect word, of what a great nation truly is, and that's a nation dedicated unto God. They are a people, when God called Israel, he called all of them originally to be priests. We talked about that a little bit last week. Okay. Well, how did the Levites end up as the priests? And specifically uh, Aaron and, and his descendants. Well, that, that, that's something that God worked out because God declared the firstborn of all of Israel to be his. They're mine. Not yours. Your firstborn child, God's. Not yours. And so God made an arrangement with the, the nation of Israel that instead of each person giving the firstborn, he took for himself the tribe of Levi. Okay? So that's, that's how that part came around. So God calls Abraham. He says, go, and I will make of you a great nation. But, but then he, he gives a caution <coughs> to everybody else, doesn't he? Because he tells Abram, at this point it's Abram, he says, those who bless you, I will bless. And those who dishonor you, I will curse. Oh. When God claims something is His, He does not allow it to be mistreated. Okay? And, and we see this now. We see that the suffering in the church, we see that, that the persecution that's going on, that will not be unaddressed. God is storing up His wrath to pay out on those who have abused His bride. Okay, so he calls him out. He says, go and I will bless you. I will make of you a great nation. Okay, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 18. Uh, flip over there real quick. That's just a couple pages over. We're still building right here. We're just building. We're laying the foundation. <clears throat> Genesis 
Okay, now this is kind of a peculiar passage because this is Abraham and Sarah, they're at their tent, and the, the uh, angel of the Lord and the angels of God, which are two very different things, are, are being uh, treated as guests by Abram, and, and <clears throat> they're on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now you're going to think, well, why, why does this fit? There's a little passage in here that is significant. So we're going to pick up, um, let's start with verse 17. Well, actually, let's go 16. It says, Then the men set out from there, and they looked down toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. Okay, so they're looking down to Sodom going, oh yeah, soon to be cinders and ashes. Okay, the Lord said, now this is the angel of the Lord. Now this is pre-incarnate Christ. Okay, if you, you want to look into this, there's an excellent book. Uh, we have a, a copy or two in the library. It's called uh, Jesus in the Hebrew Scriptures. Okay, and it talks about the, the idea, the concept of a trinity is not a New Testament idea. And it talks about all throughout the Old Testament, Jesus, the Son of God, is displayed over and over and over again. So this is one of those passages that we believe the pre-incarnate Christ is speaking here. Okay? He says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? What's he about to do? To destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, seeing that Abram, Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him, to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Now, <clears throat> this is, we, we're, we're getting a glimpse into the thinking of the mind of God. Okay? This is like an aside in a play. You know, when they're talking about like this and the guy turns and he breaches the fourth wall and he actually talks to you about what's going on in his mind, you know, that's what's going on here. God is breaching the fourth wall and he's speaking directly to us. Okay? And he says, should I hide from Abraham what I'm going to do? Why is he asking this question? Because of what follows. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. Now, look at this this clause that comes here. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. It's a huge promise. Okay? See, when God chose Abraham, he chose Abraham for his own purposes. But one of the, the, the parts of that purpose, one of the aspects of that, was that through Israel, through Abraham and Abraham's descendants, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Okay? So it's kind of like um, Ed McMahon. You know, what? Ed McMahon? Remember the, the publisher's clearing house? Ed McMahon shows up at your door. He never showed up at mine. I don't think he will now. But he would show up at the door with the million dollar prize. Okay? The nation of Israel is like Ed McMahon. They are the ones that are presenting that through them, they will present to the world the million dollar prize. Okay? So, moving forward, God has promises to the nation of Israel that they are going to become a great nation. That they will be His people. And, and further, He will be their God. Okay? Now, this is important. Okay? For whatever reason... God has chosen a particular place on earth to be His. Okay? The nation of Israel. And I, I find it interesting because in two different places in Israel, one, if you look on Google Maps, Google Earth, you can actually see spelled out the tetragrammaton, the, the four letters that make up the name of God in the, the, the geography. Just a little ways north of Jerusalem. It spells out Y-H-W-H in Hebrew. Jerusalem itself <coughs> uses the letter, looks to us, it looks kind of like a W. Okay? The three valleys that make up Jerusalem are the letter in the, the Hebrew that is used to represent the name of God. 
God has put his finger on that place. Okay? Now, <clears throat> back in the 1800s, um, Mark Twain went over to Israel. And, and he could not believe what a God-forsaken place it was. The only thing that grew there was dust. Okay? And they have pictures of this place. Just dust and dirt and rocks. Nothing growing there. Why? Because God's people were not there. God said, I will give to you a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, when Israel came back, okay, does anybody know when Israel came back? 1948. Okay? A huge story if you, if you want to know that God has authority over all the kings of the earth, all the rulers of the earth. You look at how Israel became a great nation again. Because all of the nations that were voting, not a single one of them intended that Israel would be a nation. As a matter of fact, several of them that voted were doing it to spite others, including the United States of America, who was choosing to vote Israel to be a nation, to spit in the eye of Russia, Soviet Union, to be, okay? Which they were doing the same thing. God manipulated that entire situation so that when the vote came out, people went, huh? <laughs> And Israel became a nation again, fulfilling the promise that God had given in Isaiah. All right? So, <clears throat> let's look a little bit further. We jump ahead. God has made promises to Israel. God has told Israel repeatedly, I am faithful. Matter of fact, when he brought them into Israel, he told Moses, he said, when they come in, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take them up to the mountains. Do you guys remember the names of the, the mountains? The two mountains. The Mount of Blessing and the Mount of Curse. Come on, somebody. Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Okay? And, and six of the tribes stood on one side, and six stood on the other side. And, and you want to be on the side with the blessing, don't you? Yes. Oh, man. What must that have been like to be chosen to go on the other side? Ooh. And, and, and God pronounced the blessings and the cursings. What these blessings and cursings were, were promises. Okay? They're promises that if you do what I say, if you follow my command, if you seek me with all of, my, all of your heart, I will make of you a mighty nation. One of you will chase off a hundred. Two of you will chase off a thousand. You will have your crops grow in season. You will have an abundance. You will be blessed. And when they followed God as a nation, guess what happened? They were blessed. Okay? But then God turns around and He says, but if you choose to go your own way, this is what happened. And it's the inverse. Because when you choose to forsake God, you get everything backwards. Okay? It's like one of those kaleidoscopes where you take it and you twist it, and all of a sudden the picture gets all weird. Okay? And that's what happens when you forsake God. Everything goes haywire. It gets messed up. And we see that Israel did that as well, don't we? And, and, and we see that there was famine and there was plague and there was pestilence and there were enemies. And, and the reverse was true. One of the enemy will chase off a hundred of you and two of the enemy will chase off a thousand. Okay? And we see that that happened as well. Now, one of the things that God told them in the blessings and the cursings, though, He said, but if when I have done all these things to you, I have made your land a wilderness, that wild animals have risen up and, and eaten you, and you have been assaulted by your enemies, and you've been carried off to other lands. He said, if you will turn, and you will remember, and you will repent and call out, I will save you. Amen. And I will bring you back to the land that I have promised your forefathers, and it shall be yours. Okay? So, there's a promise that we do not see is given an end. Alright? So let's, let's jump forward here. Matthew 28. Turn to Matthew 28. Remember the word go? When God spoke to Abram, He said go. Let's look at Matthew 28. We're going to pick up in verse 18. This is something that all of you should have memorized. Okay? Don't stress about it. It's, it's something that you commit to memory because it's important. This is what is called the, the Great Commission. Alright? So starting in verse 18, 
says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Okay, so he's establishing his, his credentials. How much authority does he have? Oh. All of it. Is there anybody that has more authority? No, because he's been given authority over everything. Okay, so he's establishing his right for what follows. Okay, he says, go therefore. Go. You, you recognize that? You recognize that? There's that same command. Go. And the idea in the Greek isn't so much that we get up and depart and move from this place to this place. The idea is more as you're going, as you're living, as you're doing life. Okay? So he's not saying, okay, everybody at Jesus Community Church, you've got to pick up, pack up, and, and head to a different place. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, as you are going about life, this. Go, therefore. What's the therefore, therefore? Because he has all authority. He has the right to tell us to go. And make disciples of all nations. Okay? Remember the promise that God gave to Abraham? He said that through you, I will bless all the nations. Okay? Jesus was a Jew. He wasn't blonde. He didn't have blue eyes. He did not have Anglo-Saxon features. He was Semitic. As a matter of fact, he was so Semitic that he was just common. There was nothing striking about him that would draw us to him. Except the Spirit of God. Okay? So to look at him, you'd go, okay, you probably would just look right over him in a crowd. Okay? But he says, go and make disciples of all nations. He is fulfilling that promise that was given millennia ago to Israel. Now, this kind of presents us with a little bit of a problem. And this is where the church really blew it. Okay? Because see, when, when Jesus was betrayed by Judas, he was betrayed into the hands of the Jews. The, the Jewish leaders. Okay? And um, throughout history, from that point on, the Christian church has always gotten hung up on the idea that it was the Jews who killed the Christ. He was a Jew. Okay? But they were not alone in what they did, were they? No, because they turned around and handed him over to the Gentiles. And it was actually the Gentiles that actually carried out the dirty deed for the Jews. Okay? So, so when people go, oh, they're the Christ killer. No. Jesus did not do anything other than what he wanted. Who put him up on the cross? I did. You did. He chose to go there willingly, but it was our sin that put him on that cross. Doesn't matter Jew or Greek. Okay? Doesn't matter nationality. When he went to the cross, he went for all sin. Okay? When he went up to the cross, you know, he looked down through the years and he saw Osama bin Laden. And he knew how desperately Osama bin Laden would need a savior. Now, from all that we know, he didn't need a Savior, not, not on this side of eternity. But he went to the cross for those sins as well. Okay? When he went to the cross, he looked down through the years and he saw me and you. And when he was on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, he wasn't speaking just at that moment. Because if you and I had been there, we would have been right there with him. Okay, in our ignorance. So, jumping back here, Jesus has resurrected from the dead. He has proven that he now holds the keys to death, hell, and the grave. All right? And he says, Go and make disciples of all nations. Now, you notice he doesn't say make converts of all nations. We're so excited when people will just say a prayer. 
you know, and then we just leave them. That's not, that's not what we're called to. We're called to make disciples. We, we, God brings them into the kingdom. If we're lucky, we get to there, be there and watch the show. Okay? But it's God's spirit that does the work. But then he hands them off into our care to disciple them, to, to grow them, to nurture them, sometimes to prune them, but to make sure they grow great and, uh, straight and true. Okay? So make disciples of them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, the triune God. Okay? Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. There's our directive. This is our job. Go make disciples. Baptize them. Teach them. And then he says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay? So when, when he wraps all of this up, he gives us first his authority. He gives us what he wants us to do. And then he gives us encouragement that you're not alone when you do this. I'm right there with you. Okay? So, Jews. Where does that leave us today? Well, that's not all the Bible has to say. Because Jesus didn't just go to the cross, die, be resurrected, give the Great Commission to the apostles who were Jews and say, okay, I'm done with the Jews now. You guys are the last of them. Go and save me some Gentiles. So he said, go to all the world. As a matter of fact, he gives us an order. He says, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world, which is an interesting thing because it's not just a geographical representation. Okay? Because he says, Jerusalem, that's the capital. That's, that's the, the footprint of God. Jerusalem. Okay? And then... Judea, that's, that's the Jews. Okay? That was their country at that time, Judea. But then he's asking them to go somewhere that any good Jew would go out of his way to avoid, but Samaria. Well, what is Samaria? Samaria is the cast off Jews. Those that in the exile were left behind and they intermarried with the other races that the Assyrians and the Babylonians plopped into Israel. And when the Jews came back from exile, they found them to have violated the command that God said, stay pure. Don't intermarry with these people. So now we have this, this, this half-breeds. And that's how the Jews looked at them. And, and they, 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 they were disgusted with those people. They wouldn't even let them come in to worship on the mountain. Remember when Jesus spoke to the woman at the, at the well? That's a Samaritan woman. Jesus chose to walk right through the middle of Samaria and then chose to talk to a Samaritan and chose to talk to a Samaritan woman and make known to her the secrets of God. Okay? But, but he doesn't stop there either, does he? He said, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Now, I was not born in Jerusalem. I was not born in Judea. I was not born in Samaria. I was born in one of the uttermost parts of the world. So were you. Okay? And, and some of you were born in some really uttermost parts. Okay? So, so we fall into this category. Now, Romans chapter 11. Let's flip over there real quick. I challenge you to read this chapter. Okay? Because this chapter, Paul, who sees what's going on, in, in the Gentile church, because you've got to understand, when the new church was established, it was started off by reaching out to the Jews first. Okay? And then when the Jews rejected this, it was offered to the Gentiles. Okay? But nowhere in any place does God say, you are no longer my people. Okay? You're not going to find it. Okay? But... In, in chapter 11, Paul is addressing this issue of, of Gentile pride. He's addressing this issue that the church has fallen into, dismissing Israel as no longer God. That's not our choice to make. We, we don't get to be the arbiter of that. That's, that's God's. Okay? Whom God has taken in His hand, no one can shake loose, no matter how hard we try. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump down. Um... I'm going to go all the way down to verse 28. This week, I really encourage you, read this chapter and see that God has not yet 
fulfilled his plan for Israel. Verse 28, as regards the gospel, they, being uh, Israel, the Jews, are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, and now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that by the mercy shown you, they also may now receive mercy. Okay? So the, here's, here's the, the idea. Okay? God knew exactly what was going to happen with Israel. He knew they were going to fall away. He knew that they were going to, to see the, the Messiah coming and they were not going to understand. They were going to reject Him. He knew that the Gentiles would receive the Messiah. But He has not yet given up on Israel. As a matter of fact, He will never give up on Israel because there is coming a time when the time of the Gentiles comes to an end and God will restore to Israel their place. Now, in this chapter, God says that we are grafted into the root. He calls us the wild branch. Okay, We're the wild branch. He says that the, the natural branch has been cut off. Okay? And he's speaking to Israel. Now, some people take that and say, See? God's given up on them. They've been kicked out. We're moving in. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that for a time they have been separated. But if the wild branch can grow in the root, how much more properly can the natural branch grow? God has a plan to bring and graft back into the root. Who is the root? Jesus. Jesus. Okay? He is the root. I got one more passage I want to read and, and we're going to wrap up with this. Ephesians chapter 2. Flip over there with me if you would. Really, please take some time this week. Look at Romans chapter 11. Okay? Um, Ephesians chapter 2. Paul is addressing this, this issue again. <coughs> And there's a, a little passage in here that I'm going to read. I'm going to pick up in verse 11. Uh, Therefore remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, meaning those of you who are uncircumcised were called <coughs> that by the Jews because they were circumcised. <coughs> circumcised <coughs> which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you are at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. That's where we were. Okay, We were not inheritors of the promises and the covenants of Israel. We were outside of that. Okay, We did not have God. But now in Christ Jesus you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now this, pay attention to this, okay? Because this next verse is very important. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Okay? Now what he's saying right here is that wall that separated the Jews and the Gentiles, which is the law. They were given the law that they might understand what righteous living was was. They were also given the law to understand that they could never attain it in and of their own works. Okay? But he says, um, Jesus has brought us near who are far off, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one. He has grafted both of us into the root, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Verse 15. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace. Okay? Now, here's the thing. This is the dilemma that anybody that uh, lives with the replacement theology has. God has promised Israel that when they call out to Him, He will remember them and He will save them. There is no condition placed on that. Okay? He doesn't say, oh, 72 hours and it's off. 
Okay? He doesn't say, you know, you, you breach the millennium and you're out of luck. It's an open-ended promise. Now, when Jesus came, he came to fulfill all the righteous requirements of the law so that we who could not would not have to. Now, when he came, he came to the Jew first. Why? Because that was God's promise to Abraham. I will bless you, and through you, I will bless the nations. Okay? Now, Romans 11 makes it very clear. God is not done with Israel. His plans concerning them are not yet accomplished. What's amazing to me is that so many people in the Christian church that want this replacement theology to work only want it on the conditions predicated by blessing. They don't want the ones that are cursing. They want that to stay with Israel. You guys get the cursing. We get the blessings. Na 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 na. Okay? That's not how it works. Because if you want to enter into that kind of relationship with God, you're obligated to fulfill the entire law. All of it. And it becomes based on your ability to please God, which you don't have. Okay? So, if we believe that God is always faithful to us, we have to predicate that on the idea that He is always faithful to them. He has shown Himself all throughout Scripture to be faithful to them. When they turn and call out, He answers. And the time is coming when they will call out again. As a matter of fact, um, Ezekiel makes it clear there is a time coming when God is going to call the people of the world back to Israel to be a witness and a testimony to Israel. And we're seeing that now. The, the, the Jews over in Israel, the, the Israelites, you know what they call us? They call us the Notzim. Notzim. N-O-T-Z-R-I-N. Notzim. What that is, it, it, it's the watchman. It's the one who watches and calls out the warning. Okay? And they don't even understand the significance because Ezekiel talks about a watchman that will call out and give warning. And, and they say that, you know, the, that, that we are coming back to Israel as the Nozreen and we are bringing God back into Israel. Just as he said would happen. And we're seeing that grow exponentially in these last few years. And it, it's growing incredibly. That, that, that Christians from all around the world, instead of beelining to Africa, beelining to Asia, they're beelining to Jerusalem. They're beelining to Israel. And they are presenting to God's people God's salvation. And we are seeing Jews turn to God over and over and in miraculous, fantastic ways. God is not finished with his people yet. Now, politics. Let's talk about politics real quick. They as a nation are still not serving God. They as a nation are still making decisions that are abhorrent to God. Okay? So there are a lot of things that I see them do and I go, oh, 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 why are you doing that? Okay? It's all part of God's plan. It's all part of God's plan. Uh, I had the privilege. I, uh, uh, Shelly just left, but um, she, what do you call that? Weaves? Weaving? She, I, I love watching the pictures that she puts up because she weaves these beautiful things together. And, and she knows where each thread is going and, and makes it fit with the whole. See, God is, is doing that with all of our lives, with all of the nation's lives. He is weaving them together in a tapestry that he will present to himself. Okay? And Israel is a main thread, a golden thread in that tapestry. And there is a time where they have separated themselves from God. They become our enemies because of the gospel. But God is going to bring them back. And he is going to fulfill his promises to them. And we will be one. Just like Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Okay? We're one. As a matter of fact, he says in Ephesians uh, chapter 4, it's one body. Okay? So, politically, yeah, we may disagree with the politics. Don't side against them. Because when all the nations rise up against Israel, guess who wins? God does. Okay? God does. And, and God is going to win in such a dramatic fashion that Israel is going to turn and call out to him. Okay? And they will be saved. So, 
Where does that leave us? It leaves us with two things that we should be considering at all times. One, Israel is God's people and they need his salvation. You need to be praying for the salvation of Israel, specifically the people of Israel. One of the great things that I took away from our trip last year is Israel now has a face for me. I can look at some of the people that we saw while we were there and I, I can picture the people that I'm praying for now. Okay. Two, America is not God's chosen place. Okay? As beautiful as this valley is, and all the majesty and grandeur of the mountains and the rivers and the streams and the animals and the, all that stuff, all of that, this is not the place God has chosen. The place that he chose is Israel. And when you read this word, you've got to read it with the understanding that it's Israel-centric not American-centric, okay? So you need to grasp that understanding because we all too often want to apply our culture to the scripture then, rather than applying scripture to our culture, okay? Let's pray. Father, we bless you, and I thank you, God, that you are the almighty God. I thank you that nothing is beyond your grasp, nothing is out of your sight. I thank you, Father, that you have promised to the people of Israel, that you will save them, that a remnant will be saved. They will call out, and you will save. And Father, we pray for them right now. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we pray a blessing over Abraham's seed. God, that you would not forget them. Remind them that you are their God, that they are a blessed people because of you. And we ask, Lord God, that you would remind us that, that we treat all of this with humility because there was nothing in our, ourselves that had value. And yet you chose to make us your very own. So we bless you today and we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.